lady from Florida took place in the U.S. or in Ecuador. No, Venezuela. And that, sir, it, uh, the U.S. or Venezuela. And that, sir, is precisely the point. This concludes no, no, no. the hearing. She was, she was we thank it, the Attorney General. My point was, it was Venezuela. Thank the Attorney General for participating without, all, without objection. All members will have five legislative days to submit additional written records for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. We have been watching some intense testimony between Attorney General William Barr and the House Judiciary Committee. For more analysis, I want to bring in now Molly Hooper and Rebecca Royfe. Molly is a CBSN political contributor and veteran Capitol Hill reporter. CBS News legal contributor Rebecca Royfe is also joining us. She's a professor of law at the New York Law School. She was a she was formerly the assistant district attorney for New York City. Wow, Rebecca, this was getting heated. Um, tell us a little bit more about what the congresswoman was getting at when asking the attorney if Attorney General uh, William Barr would commit to not releasing a report by uh, Durham prior to the election. For people who haven't been following along but just saw, uh, just tuned in recently, this this turned into a kind of a shouting match. Tell us more about what's going on. Yeah, it sure did. Um, so there is a DOJ policy that um, the Department of Justice should not um, act in such a way as to influence um, an upcoming election. People might remember that was a big deal when um, James Comey made certain announcement about, announcements about Hillary Clinton's emails. So um, we are now back in the same land. And what the um, Congresswoman was asking him is, will you commit to abiding by that policy? Because if you release this particular report, and just as a reminder, the report that she's talking about is a report on the origins of the Russia probe. So Bill Barr has been very insistent that this um, Russia probe was a hoax. He's been echoing the president on that point. And he's done a number of things to further that narrative, one of which is to refer investigation to the Department of Justice, to a particular U.S. attorney in Connecticut, um, Durham. And so what the congressman was saying was, will you just hold off? Because obviously, whatever that says um, may indeed influence the election one way or another. And the attorney general would not commit to that. I thought that was a pretty important moment because um, one would think that no matter what the um, report says, it would be um, a grenade thrown in, in the middle of, <laughs> of this election so close to um, the, the actual election day. Um, so, you yeah. know, that's, I mean, that's that's what's going on in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. To have to have seen all of that play out uh, with uh, with Comey in the last election, both when he issued his um, his indictment um, of Hillary Clinton in a informal, non legal sense, and then uh, and and all that he was accused of in terms of uh, shaping that election, which then created the foundation for his dismissal, according to President Trump, that he had lost the support of the rank and file. It, it was really an incredible moment. Uh, Molly, I'm going to bring you into this as well. This was a hearing that was mm -hmm. essentially 14 months in the making for House Democrats. Um, you and I started to talk about uh, how contentious it, it was. Um, it got more contentious since then. Yes. Um, and one of the problems was, uh, I think, for, for viewers, it seemed like the attorney general was was rarely given an opportunity to actually answer the questions that were posed to him. Just at the end there, uh, before it abruptly cut off, um, right. we heard a Republican congressperson, I couldn't tell who it was in the, in, uh, in the hearing room there, say, uh, you're not giving him an opportunity to, to answer. You're accusing him of violating his oath of office, and you're not giving him an opportunity to answer. Right. Uh, tell me what you're thinking about uh, the Democrats' strategy and whether or not you thought they were actually successful in getting any information out of the attorney general. Lana, I'm telling you, I've been waiting for this hearing for a long time, just as a lot of people up on Capitol Hill have. And I got to tell you, it, it didn't proceed the way that I anticipated. And towards the end, it was more like a, a 10 car pile up on the, the highway that was caused by a jackknife truck. I mean, it was a mess. It was a mess, and it kind of felt like it wasn't going anywhere, but everybody was trying to trying to get out and, and trying to do their own thing. Um, it, you know, at, by, about an hour ago, 
Bill Barr just started talking back to Democrats. He, he pretty much, since he hadn't been able to answer questions, he just started giving it back to him. Well, why should I answer that question? Well, you're not giving me, me any respect. And, and what did he say? He asked about it about 20 minutes ago. He asked for a quick five minute break and the chairman wasn't going to give it to him. And he goes, he goes, you know, you're a real class act. He said that to Jerry Nadler. I mean, th this this hearing was so full of tempers. And I think that um, there was a lack of patience and urgency on the part of all the congressmen, most, particularly the Democratic congressmen, for whichever issue they were interested in, like police reform, um, the idea of systemic racism in our institutions, um, George Floyd and, and the protesters and, and sending federal officials and the federal law enforcement to, to cities to tamp down protests and whatnot, that I think that the strategy really wasn't there. But throughout it all, Bill Barr defended the, the actions that he's taken thus far on all the issues, be it politicization of the DOJ with the Stone and the Michael Flynn case, or be it sending federal troops to defend a federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon. Um, he, he didn't back down on a lot of these issues that he's come under a lot of heat for. And I think that that was very frustrating to a lot of members because, again, you only get five minutes, and when your five minutes are up, the gavel comes down and you're done. Um. One might argue then that you should try not to or to focus on what questions you want to ask. As you and I both know, you're sometimes limited by how much time you have. So, <laughs> Molly, where do uh, Democrats on oversight actually, or where do the Democrats who are interested actually in oversight efforts, where do they go from here? I it, it just looked like I think your your analysis was pretty good about um, nobody came out of this necessarily as a winner, and everybody just seems more more dug in. Well, well, the interesting thing is initially, the Democrats wanted to get Bill Barr in front of the committee and committee full stop because there had been so many delays and um, what with COVID and sort of miscommunications. At last year, the Democrats subpoenaed Bill Barr to come before the committee. He didn't come. They found him in contempt, and nothing really happened. And, and this go-round, they were looking at going down that same road. Well, right now, Steve Cohen, who's a new member from Tennessee, he's a Democratic member of the Judiciary Committee, one of the senior ranking members, introduced a resolution that, for, that would require, essentially, the Judiciary Committee to investigate Bill Barr for misconduct that could eventually lead to impeachment charges in the House. Well, Democratic leaders, senior Democratic leaders, um, aren't so sure about going down that road because it didn't really go very well from earlier this year with the president. So it wasn't that effective. However, um, what has been discussed, a possibility of withholding um, money appropriations from Bill Barr's personal office if he doesn't start implementing certain uh, regulations and, and, and making certain reforms when it comes to police reforms or looking into patterns of uh, patterns and practices investigations going out to police forces that, that appear to have been profiling and such. I mean, but really, it's unclear exactly how they proceed because, as you said, Lana, it was this hearing, let me see if, I, if I'm summing up correctly, this hearing was so kind of disjointed and all over the place. We were talking about illegal immigrants, election um, fraud, um, the, the Obamacare, health care, ACA, everything. Right. So affordable so health care, the ACA. So the much so that it's like we're was policing. So where do you... The, exactly. It was all over the place. So where do you go from here? They really do need to come up with a strategy now. And I think that what's been very difficult is with COVID-19, you know, essentially sucking up all the oxygen up on Capitol Hill, when it comes time for one of these blockbuster hearings, it, again, w w how they proceed is a, is, um, is a bit of a question mark. And, I, and we'll see if the same sort of pattern happens tomorrow in the, the, another big blockbuster hearing that they have with the tech giants, with the CEOs of the, the tech companies that are coming up before the cap, before a subcommittee, the Judiciary Committee. So, so we'll see if that changes their strategy at all. But at this point, it's a little unclear. 
Well, I also want to let our viewers know, apparently, the the Republican congressman that I was referencing that we heard in the background but, but weren't able to see on camera was uh, Representative uh, Jim Jordan representing Ohio's fourth. All right, Rebecca, there's a clip I'd like to play from when ta Texas Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee was questioning Attorney General Barr about racism in American policing. Let's listen. Does the Trump Justice Department seek to end systemic racism and racism in law enforcement? I just need a yes or no answer. To the extent there is racism in any of our institutions in this country and the police, then obviously this administration is, will fully enforce this. So you agree right? that there may be systemic racism? To the extent, in, in, in where? where? Uh, let me continue my line of questioning. I, I don't agree that there's systemic racism in the police department. Specifically. Generally in this country. So, Rebecca, this has obviously become one of the uh, central debates that's happening in our country right now. Uh, what did you take from, uh, from Barr's comments there about how he views police reform efforts um, as, the, as the head of, um, as, as the attorney general of the United States? He has certainly a role to play. So how do you think he'll embrace that role? So, you know, I thought he hit a, a pretty good tone, actually, in acknowledging that um, there are some real problems in this country and that um, those problems need to be addressed. I think he did a poorer job when it came to what specifically are you committed to doing um, to address those problems. And I think that um, what he is committed to doing is far different from what many um, advocates of Black Lives Matter and would want to have happen. And what he has done in the past has been far less than what predecessor presidents and administrations have done. So, um, you know, I think the, the one of the key questions in that interchange is so relevant is how do you define the problem? What is systemic racism? Where does it exist? And then how do we address it? And to me, you know, this is a political, there's a political difference between our two parties in um, how they define racism, where they see it, and what they want to do about it. And so I think, you know, Barr here um, is pretty much um, what we would expect, expressing, um, you know, the fairly, a fairly standard view that, you know, this is not a problem that is in all police departments that faces everybody. It's an isolated problem of a few um, individuals who are, you know, problematic, like the officer we saw in the Floyd video. And I think there are a lot of people who feel like that falls, falls um, quite short of um, an accurate description and therefore will not lead to the proper um, response by this administration. Certainly, we saw that uh, from if I, just, if I can, Sheila Jackson. Oh. Sorry, go for it, Molly. Right. Well, <laughs> sorry, sorry Lana, I was gonna one say. One quick thought. If I could just, if, if, oh, one quick thought, if I could just say something. What Barr did say was the wrong thing to do is defund the police because these police forces need more training and with 18,000 mm -hmm. of them across the country, they need training in de-escalation and how to handle tactic, how to handle situations when tensions rise. Essentially, right, and I don't think uh, that yes. um, I don't think Biden either wants to defund the police, but certainly there are some local um, politicians in these right. different cities that are definitely pushing for that. Correct, correct. Biden has right. not uh, indicated that he is in support of defunding the police, though he has indicated that uh, that perhaps moving some of the budgets around would be appropriate. All right, too much to get to in the limited amount of time <laughs> that we have. But Rebecca Royfe and Molly Hooper, thank you both. <laughs> nice seeing you. Thank you. President Trump will speak about the coronavirus at 5 p.m. as Congress remains divided over how to tackle its next spending package. On Monday, Republicans unveiled a trillion-dollar package. It would reduce the weekly unemployment insurance bonus to $200 per week or a 70 percent replacement of wages. Democrats have proposed a bill three times that amount. They also want to keep the unemployment bonus at $600 a week. CBS News White House correspondent Paula Reed has more. The pandemic is not finished. The economic pain is not finished. Senate Republicans made an opening offer to Democrats last night. The HEALS Act, that's health, economic assistance, liability protection, and schools. 
The plan protects employers from being sued over COVID transmission and extends some jobless benefits like the $600 weekly benefit that is set to expire. But Republicans want to reduce the benefit to 70 to 75 percent of the wages a person made before COVID. So we want to continue to help the unemployed, but we want to encourage work. The Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer blasted the plan. The administration has bungled this crisis, and now they want to take $1,600 out of your pocket every single month. As coronavirus cases continue to rise across the country, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien became the highest ranking U.S. official to test positive. O'Brien works in the West Wing and closely with the president, but as he left the White House Monday to head to North Carolina, the president said he had not recently seen his top advisor. No, I haven't seen him lately. I heard he, uh, he tested. Yeah, uh, I have not seen him. Just as the virus reaches his inner circle, the president, while touring a biotech company in the battleground state of North Carolina, offered a vague directive to some governors to reopen their economies. A lot of the governors should be opening up states that uh, they're not opening. And Paula's there at the White House and joining us now, Paula, to start off, can you tell us in what ways do Democrats and Republicans actually agree? And we heard some of the areas in which they're still far apart, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that as well. Well, Lana, as you kind of saw there in the piece, the showdown began late last night as Republicans finally made their opening offer uh, to Democrats. And the good news for many Americans is that they both agree on sending another round of $1,200 stimulus checks to many Americans who qualify. Now, they also agree on sending about $100 billion uh, in funding, allocating that for schools. But from there, on most other things, they're about $2 trillion apart. And one of the most high-profile controversies has been on extending that jobless benefit. Now, you may remember back in April, Congress passed uh, this benefit that's about $600 per person per week as a federal benefit on top of any state unemployment benefits that you receive. Now, Republicans uh, and some other business leaders have argued that that has disincentivized some people from going back to work. Now, Democrats reject that. They say nobody's going to pass on having a job so that they can get these benefits. But Republicans want to see uh, this benefit extended, but as a at a reduced rate. They've come up with this formula. They're saying, OK, if you get this, this, this top off, this extra federal benefit, your total benefits should be capped at 70 to 75 percent of what you make. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi Atlanta says, look, that's way too complicated. The state systems, they're not going to be able to do all this math. Also, a lot of people don't receive one salary. They get their income from several different sources. Uh, so there is a possibility that this will likely be uh, this, this proposal. This will really have to be something that they're going to have to focus on, drill down and find something that's not only a compromise in terms of bipartisan agreement, but also something that's actually actable, that you can actually do and implement across this diversified system. Yeah, that Two trillion dollars seems pretty far apart, Paula. All right, well, the country's top law enforcement official, William Barr, has been on Capitol Hill testifying today. Republicans have included plans for a new FBI building in the bill. Tell us why that's significant. Well, this was just wild. Uh, you saw Mitch McConnell, uh, as he was rolling out the bill, someone asked him, they said, hey, we see about $1.8 billion for a new FBI building in a bill that is centered on economic relief for COVID, Mitch McConnell was caught off guard. Now, he checked with an aide who confirmed that money was in there. And then Mitch McConnell, he really just threw the White House under the bus. He told the reporter, he's like, you know what? That's something the administration insisted on, and you're going to have to ask them why they insisted on this. We did just that. I asked the White House why this was included. Oh, wow. This has nothing to do with COVID. Uh, and they say, well, the president has long believed that the FBI needs a new headquarters building. There's no doubting that. If you go to the Hoover building, there are chunks of it that, that fall off. There are actually nets to catch those pieces. There's no doubt that this is a need. But one question is, why is it in the COVID bill? And the other is about the president's involvement in this specific project. The Department of Justice's Office of Inspector General is currently investigating this project and whether the president tried to interfere in the rebuilding plans in an effort to help his hotel. Now, the current FBI headquarters is approximately a block away uh, from the president's uh, Trump to hotel here in Washington. And the inspector general is looking at whether the president scrapped plans or influenced plans to move the FBI headquarters out of D.C. 
and possibly sell to a developer who could have built a competing hotel. Uh, that's currently under investigation, but it just raises so many questions about why they would include this in the COVID stimulus bill, something that's under a lot of scrutiny from reporters. This has nothing to do with the pandemic and unearths this controversy from about a year ago about the president's involvement in the FBI headquarters building project. Right, a huge controversy back before there was COVID and back before our entire mm -hmm. country uh, sort of flipped upside down. Um, very interesting, too, that the Senate Majority Leader was unaware. Good follow-up on that, Paula. All right, President Trump has retweeted a number of false messages about the coronavirus and Dr. Anthony Fauci in the past 24 hours. I, I want to play for our viewers first how Fauci responded this morning on ABC. I don't know how to address that. I'm just going to certainly continue doing my job. I, I you know, I'm, I don't tweet. I don't, I don't even read them. So I, I don't really want to go there. I just will continue to do my job no matter what comes out because I think it's very important. We're in the middle of a crisis with regard to an epidemic, a pandemic. This is what I do. This is what I've been trained for my entire professional life, and I'll continue to do it. To the charge you've been misleading the American public. I have not been misleading the American public under any circumstances. So the person from the administration who has most been the attack dog against Dr. Fauci is White House Trade Advisor Peter Navarro. Bala, you spoke this morning with Navarro. Uh, he has criticized Fauci multiple times, both to you and in public. So what did he tell you this morning? Well, we tried to ask him about the White House attacks on Dr. Fauci and specifically if Peter Navarro got any any feedback or any blowback from the president after he published a scathing op-ed against Fauci in USA Today about two weeks ago. Well, uh, Peter Navarro, who is, is fairly open with the press, he often comes and answers questions. He did not want to answer that question, and he stormed off without answering. But it speaks to this larger question of why so many people in this administration uh, feel that they are entitled and enabled to go and attack Dr. Fauci in the middle of a pandemic. You have Peter Navarro's op-ed two weeks ago. You have the White House press office pushing what many people looked at as opposition research on Dr. Fauci. The White House said they were asked for a list of mistakes, but they also sent that list to people who hadn't asked for it. Of course, the president uh, has publicly criticized Fauci as well. The president has directly been asked about his relationship with Dr. Fauci. Uh, recently, in the past 10 days, he sort of backed off some of the criticisms, insisted that the two men have a good relationship. He likes him, though the two men do not always agree. But clearly, the president, once again, retweeting uh, a tweet that highlights uh, misstatements or accusations of false statements by Dr. Fauci. Look, Lana, everyone, pretty much every official in this response has said something that eventually turned out to be not true. And the president is not highlighting uh, misstatements from Secretary Azar or Dr. Burks. But no one has made more statements that turned out to be false about the pandemic than President Trump. He has insisted that it would disappear, that it would disappear without a vaccine, that China was being transparent. The list goes on and on. So there, the question remains, why does the president continue to highlight Dr. Fauci's mistakes? Uh, is it that he's truly upset about these mistakes? Or is it, as many people have suggested, that he's a little bit jealous of the limelight that Fauci commands and the fact that he has a very high approval rating and enjoys sort of a broad-based trust from a lot of folks in America. All right, Paula Reed, lots to unpack there, thank you. President Trump is calling for businesses across the country to accelerate the reopening process in order to jumpstart the U.S. economy. As more cases of COVID-19 continue to surge in parts of the U.S., several of the Trump administration's top health officials are asking states to scale back their plans in an effort to control the spread of the deadly virus. CBS News national lead national correspondent David Begnow has the latest. We're seeing a lot of... Um just panic and people are very scared right now. Adrian Gonzalez says he doesn't know what his employees will do if his restaurant is forced to close. He's already reduced the staff of 17 to just four. And on the West Coast, a similar story for Marty Caballero, who owns a Portland barbershop. He says he and many people he knows need the extra $600 that they've been getting from the federal government. What happens when they shut us down again? There's no extra assistance. We're all getting the minimum and no one can pay their bills at all. What happens then? The balance of lives and livelihood is the most difficult thing of all of this. Back here in Miami Beach, the mayor, Dan Gilbert, says his city's economy depends on businesses that draw people together, restaurants, hotels, and entertainment venues. 
And he says the state's contact tracing program is not equipped to handle a reopening. 83% are not being called at all. There's no contact. They're not being told to quarantine. How does the lack of contact tracing affect you economically in Miami Beach? Well, the contact tracing is, is, until we have a vaccine, the contact tracing is sort of the vaccine. The ongoing push between public health and economic concerns continue as many states see surges in cases. Listen to what Dr. Deborah Burks of the White House Coronavirus Task Force said. We can see what is happening in the South moving north. There are states that do need to close their bars to decrease indoor gatherings to less than 10. One of those states is Tennessee, and Dr. Burks met with the governor, Bill Lee, but he waved off her recommendation. I've said from the very beginning of this pandemic that there's nothing off the table. I've also said we're not going to close the economy back down and we're not going to. Dr. Anthony Fauci is urging states. Listen to Dr. Burks. We've got to make sure that other states that are starting to show an uptick do what we're talking about before you get the major surge. You know, in suggesting to Tennessee's governor that they roll back their reopening, Dr. Burks used Arizona as an example. Cases were surging there. Their test positivity rate was incredibly high. But the governor there did roll back the reopening. He closed the bars, limited dining uh, to only outdoors. Everybody wears a mask. And now Arizona apparently has turned a corner over the last four weeks. So Arizona is now an example for states like Tennessee and others as to why they may want to consider tougher measures. David Begno, CBS News, Miami Beach, Florida. Baseball's rocky return is ahead on CBSN. A COVID outbreak sidelines an MLB team and forces the cancellation of several games. What it could mean for the future of the already shortened season. Plus, new questions are raised after a series of moped accidents, including one that killed a TV reporter. It's causing officials to take another look at its safety standards. Stick with us. You're streaming CBSN. The biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do you think that the president has the authority to send in active duty troops? Face the questions you want answered. Did the CDC let the American people down? Tell me about the decision. When was it made? Who made it? What is the next area that you are concerned about? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection here in the United States? You bring up a very good point, Margaret. Margaret, that's a great question. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. You're looking at the top of the Capitol steps where the body of civil rights pioneer John Lewis lies in state in Washington, D.C. Lewis is the first black lawmaker to lie in the Capitol Rotunda. That's where lawmakers paid respects to their longtime colleague who served in Congress for 33 years. Tomorrow, his body is flown to Atlanta where it will lie in state at the Georgia Capitol. Thursday will close out a six-day celebration of Lewis's legacy with a service. Lewis's funeral will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time at Ebenezer Baptist Church Horizon Sanctuary in Atlanta. His body will then be buried at Southview Cemetery. It's been five days since the start of the delayed Major League Baseball season, and the MLB has already been forced to cancel multiple games after more than a dozen players on the Miami Marlins tested positive for COVID-19. On Sunday, four players sat out against the Philadelphia Phillies after testing positive, but the ripple effect has since been felt across the league. CBS This Morning Saturday co-host Dana Jacobson has the latest. In a surprise move, the Miami Marlins battled the Philadelphia Phillies on Sunday, despite four positive tests within the organization. Now that number has reportedly jumped to at least 13. Every day we're taking risks, so uh, that's what the players all around the league are doing. The Marlins outbreak is creating a ripple effect across the league. Monday night, Major League Baseball postponed the Marlins-Orioles and Yankees-Phillies games out of precaution. 
Jason Stark is a senior baseball writer for the sports journalism site The Athletic. Baseball had a plan. Uh, it has 113 pages worth of protocols, but there's no specific language that deals with a situation quite like this, where you have multiple infections on one team. I don't put this in the nightmare category. Commissioner Rob Manfred says owners have not yet considered canceling or suspending the season. We expected we were going to have positives at some point in time. Um, I remain optimistic that the protocols are strong enough um, that it will allow us to continue to play. His comments come as managers and players remain concerned for their safety. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm scared. That's Washington Nationals manager Dave Martinez. Last year, he missed at least three games during the season after undergoing a heart procedure. I worry about these guys. I worry about everybody around us. I don't want anybody to get sick. Dr. Zachary Binney is an epidemiologist at Emory University. He says the Marlins should quarantine for two weeks, but it's premature to suspend the whole season. So far, what you've seen is a disaster in one market and one team. But if you were to see something like this again happen on a second team, I think you'd have to think very seriously about it. For now, Major League Baseball is only saying that the Marlins will miss two games. Obviously, all eyes are on Major League Baseball to see how they handle things, perhaps none watching more closely than the NFL, which is set to become the only other major pro sports franchise in the U.S. to operate outside of that protected zone, better known as the bubble. Dana Jacobson, CBS News, Boston. So to dig into all of this, DeMichael Cole is joining us now. He's a sports reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. DeMichael, tonight's game between the New York Yankees and the Philadelphia Phillies has again been delayed due to COVID-19 concerns. With the shortened season, I know fans are looking for every single one of these games, but I'm wondering what protocols the MLB has moving forward if we keep seeing positive test results like this. Yeah, it's, it's the most interesting factor to all of this because – when you think about what Commissioner Rob Manfred said in his, you know, in his statement, and he basically said that we're fine, you know, as far as baseball goes. He said this was something that they expected, and he feels like it's more of a one-case thing than, you know, a precursor for what can come forward in the MLB. So will it affect more teams going forward? That's what everyone wants to see because, honestly, if that happens, I don't think the MLB has an answer. I don't think they have an answer if that, ha if that happens simply because they're only prepared to adjust to one outbreak like this. If it becomes a constant thing or, you know, with the Phillies players, no one tested positive. So say if a Phillies player would have tested positive and it would have affected the opposing team, that would have been a completely scenario that, that Major League Baseball wasn't prepared for. But right now... They think they're in good hands, so we'll see, you know, how they react going forward. Hmm. All right, well, the NBA, which restarts this week, the NHL and MLS have all decided that they would carry out the rest of the season uh, in a kind of bubble atmosphere. Commissioner Manfred has previously rejected that bubble idea, but do you think that that might be where he pivots to if, an, if these cases continue uh, to, uh, to show themselves in, the, in, in baseball? I think baseball will cancel the season before they go to a bubble simply because, for one, it's, it's very late with baseball. And the main thing in baseball during the discussions between Major League Baseball owners and the Players Association was they want to finish the season before November. You know, baseball is a spring sport. It's a summer sport. You don't want to play baseball in 20-degree weather. And a main thing for them was, and they squeezed this schedule. If you look at the schedule now, each of these teams are playing 60 games in sort of like a 70-day period. So this was something they couldn't afford. And a bubble would have been the best-case scenario. I mean, you look at the success with the NBA not having a positive test since July 13th or with 844 people being tested in the MLS and no positive tests in over two weeks. So that, that method is clearly working and that's where baseball went wrong. They had the opportunity, you know, they had the proposal to play in Arizona. Obviously, with baseball, it's more difficult than those sports. I will say that, being that you have 30 teams and baseball players play every single day, pretty much. As I said earlier, they're playing about 60 games in a 70-day period. So it would have been more difficult. But at the end of the day, it's something they could have done, and it's what they should have done. 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm also thinking that there's less contact between baseball and as right. opposed to something like football, right? NFL training camp is slated to begin this week. Uh, and then also the NCAA has not yet decided whether or not we're going to see any college sports this fall. I'm wondering how much the current situation for the MLB is potentially going to affect football. Yeah, and that's the money-making sport. I mean, if you look at last year, 47 of the 50 top live TV shows were NFL games. So you can talk about all these other sports, but no sport brings in the money like the NFL. So you you know the NFL, of all sports, they're going to do everything in their power to play. And we talk about how hard a bubble is in some of these other sports. Football, especially the NFL, it's the hardest sport. To have a bubble you have 53 players on the final roster but going into training camp teams have 75 plus players so if you think about those players plus probably a, another 50 or so staff members and you're talking about 